and there was a, a flashing sign on the interstate or highway. I can't remember exactly where we were, but there was a flashing deer crossing sign. And I was like, you know, I've seen a million deer crossing signs and rarely a deer near one. But we come around the corner and there was a Congo line of deer that went over the horizon. You know, it was hundreds of deer in a single file line that stretched from one horizon way out to the next in the desert. And they were just head to tail cruising and, and crossing the highway in single file. It was so incredibly amazing to me. I never knew that deer were capable of such a thing because for one, in my area, deer are very few in number because, you know, a lot of them live inside mountain lions. And two, the, the migration that occurs here is over a short distance, but it's thousands of feet of elevation. So that lateral migration that occurs in Wyoming, truly amazing. These are stories of outdoor adventure and expert advice from folks with calloused hands. I'm James Nash, and this is the Six Ranch Podcast. The Six Ranch Podcast is brought to you by Sig Sauer. Sig is a leading provider and manufacturer of firearms, electro optics, ammunition, air guns, and suppressors. For over 250 years, Sig Sauer Inc. has evolved and thrived by blending American ingenuity, German engineering, and Swiss precision. Today, Sig Sauer is synonymous with industry leading quality and innovation which has made it the brand of choice amongst the U.S. military, the global defense community, law enforcement, competitive shooters, hunters, and responsible citizens. Sig Sauer is also a premier provider of elite firearms instruction and tactical training at the Sig Sauer Academy located in New Hampshire. For more information about Sig Sauer and its complete line of products, visit SigSauer.com. Let's just say that I want to go hunt in Wyoming and there is a reality that if I do that in certain parts of the state, that at some point a grizzly bear might come and decide that I need to be dead. How do I prevent that from happening? I think step one is you got to be proficient with whatever self-defense you want to carry or you're planning on carrying um, for those, for those environments, because All too often, we just waltz into the woods thinking we're the only thing out here and we're at the top of the food chain. But when you're not, man, you got to know how to react and what you're going to react with, I think, first and foremost. What's your move? Oh, it's situation dependent. Do I get the opportunity to see one of these big fuzzy critters running at me or do I have a a, a spook attack or something where the, the bear's coming at me the critters coming at me without any time to prepare uh no time to prepare i'm gonna go spray because i'm gonna literally spray and pray if i have the time to prepare then i will go to a chambered pistol of some kind or chambered firearm of some kind um depending on the hunt okay so are you carrying a pistol with you oh yeah yeah what about what about if you're going to go backcountry style and you're going to be camping out? Um, what are some considerations that you have to have if you're going to be sleeping out there with the bears? Dude, keeping a clean camp is really important. Um, even when it comes down to uh, brushing your teeth, if you're someone who does that in the backcountry, uh, making sure that you're doing that away from where you're sleeping because anything that offers some sort of interesting, sweet smell and scent that might be appetizing is something that could be a potential attractant. So you got to keep that thing away from where you're laying your head at night. Okay. That's a good step anyway. So basically wherever you're sleeping, the only thing that you're doing there is sleeping and then everything else you've got to do in another place. I sure try to man. And I'm not going to say that I'm perfect at this, right? It's, it's definitely what is, is kind of preached to be the best idea. The other thing that, there's a whole nother school of thought that says either you don't do anything that's smelly next to where you're laying your head 
or you bring all of your food in and you sleep with it, right? Because then there's a, the, the, the thought is that your human scent is going to surround that thing that is a potential attractant anyway. So I, like I said, there's two schools of thought. I'm going to err with keeping that stuff out of camp though. I'm, I'm going to eat on my glassing knob or, you know, at a wallow someplace where I'm hanging out, like, you know, like away from where I'm going to call it nighty night for, for a few hours. Am I being like overly weird in, in even asking about this or, or is it a real problem? It is a serious thing that people need to consider, especially where like, you know, bears in particular are the, they're the hot topic right now in Wyoming, just because they're continuing to expand their range. But man, it's even worth thinking about if you're in a place with, with other predators where you're not the, the apex of the food chain. I mean, I think we continually find each year that with human predator conflicts, we don't always win. And oftentimes if you're not prepared, you don't win. Right. So I think it's worthwhile to think about these things. And I'll be honest though, too, like another factor of it is, is like, it adds an element that is kind of magical if you're not at the top of the food chain. But I think the thing that we forget is that we got to prepare to not be to the top of the food chain where over the last generations, you know, a couple generations, we've been pretty lasting Like if the only thing out there is a couple of mountain lions or a couple of black bears, like you don't have to take the precautions that you do. If, if there's black bears, lions, grizzly bears, and wolves all on the landscape at the same time. Yeah. You know, when, uh, when wolves were first showing up here in Oregon and, and starting to cause problems, I remember my dad talking to somebody in Alaska um, and there's not a lot of cattle that get raised in Alaska, but there's a few. And, uh, and he was talking to a cattleman from up there and he's like, man, how, how do you deal with, with wolves? And he goes, we don't even think about them. He said, grizzlies, that's what you got to worry about. And it really kind of saw that same thing happen in Wyoming where it's like you guys started to really have to deal with both of these predators at the same time. And Wyoming was like, you know what, the, these grizzlies are going to take up all of our focus and, and, uh, not a hundred percent, but whenever you have both of those animals, the grizzlies are significantly a bigger threat to both livestock and people than wolves are. Yeah. The other thing that Wyoming did that was, I think, pretty innovative at the time it, it pissed people off on both sides but like i think was a pretty good conclusion was they created this whole buffer outside of the greater yellowstone ecosystem that basically turned them into a coyote uh, management system so like wolves outside of this trophy management zone as they call it are basically you could shoot them on site like a coyote yeah they're and that predatory management a predator yeah is that predatory management zone, man, it has, um, I think, in a lot of ways, kept wolves on their toes. Um, and then inside that trophy management zone, they fluctuated kind of the quotas and stuff with re related to where the population is at. There's some crazy dynamics with the population that I'm not a full expert on as to why it is or how, but it sure seems like it, within that trophy management area that there's a pretty good equilibrium that they've reached. Uh, you're not seeing the massive spike like in wolf populations like you see in Oregon or Idaho for that matter. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can only have so many fish in the tank, right? So once they've yeah. saturated an area and increased um, their population to the point of carrying capacity, then the only thing that they can do is expand that territory. And that's what you're seeing with the bears now too. So you talk exactly. about- and yeah, you, you talked about grizzly bear expansion. Tell me a little bit more about what that means. So, especially within the Endangered Species Act, like they have the, they, people long before I was interested in this stuff, uh, worked together to define where they determined grizzly bear suitable habitat is in Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. And um, this imaginary line, um, they figure once that reaches capacity, those bears have been recovered and are no longer in, at least on that population segment on the endangered species list or need to be on there. Now, what you're having happen now is bears in Cody that get in trouble for 
predating on livestock or getting into honey boxes are getting picked up and, and removed for that misbehavior and by the game and fish. And they're being moved on top of another bear's home range, even if it's on the other side of this, you know, habitat, the suitable habitat. Um, you're picking up one bear and putting him on top of another. So essentially there's not any room left within this suitable habitat. And that's where you get them drifting way outside of the, of, of the recovery zone. And, you know, like there's a, a town called Kemmer in the Southern Wyoming range that has had a couple sightings of bears that are quite a few miles south of where they are wanting, where, where the managers have determined that they want them to be. So um yeah man that's like the kind of extent of where we're at now so they're they're moving out of the trees and into the desert more or less more or less yeah it's, that camera country it's like where those bears have been found is uh broken sagebrush aspen and and timber stuff so yes i mean uh if anyone's read the cj box series um there's a there's a whole book about this bear that drifts out into the red desert and um that's not too far off from reality nowadays Interesting. You know, I read some CJ box back in like, I don't know, 2005, 2006, um, firefighting days. And it was great, man. It, I, I was so interested. I needed to know what happened next. I thought Joe Pickett was the coolest guy. And, uh, if you watch that Joe Pickett series, that's on TV now. It is. Yeah. Awful. A- that is some of the dumbest shit. <laughs> <laughs> I would so let me say this my significant other Jess uh Jess Johnson she is I will say one she's a more of an expert on grizzly bears like, than I am and she's got some really good information on this uh, but two she is a much more of an expert on the Joe Pickett series and she <laughs> will bitch <laughs> till the cows come home that they screwed that series up so I totally agree it doesn't look anything like Wyoming either so let alone that part but uh yeah no I'm right there with you yeah, no, like 10 minutes into that first episode, I was, you know, heading to the bathroom to find some baby aspirins to chew on because I, I just couldn't take it, man. Couldn't take it. They'd, they'd done they done Joe wrong. they done Joe wrong, dude. And then Romanowski is the guy. Anyway, we yeah. can digress down to this. Yeah. Hole, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't watch that if you want a good representation of Wyoming. It's yeah. not. Definitely not. But uh, no, some of those some of those murder mysteries that CJ Box wrote. They're fantastic. You know, I, and I am, I'm quick to call stuff like that, a trash novel. Um, but I don't think that's, that's what he wrote. I, I think that there's some really good writing. There's excellent imagery. You feel connected with the character. The plot develops at the right time. Um, he's a, he's a masterful author. Absolutely. And I will say like, there are some really accurate elements of, of CJ Box's writing that he gets, he nails it. And, and it's based loosely on a lot of like true characters and a lot of true happenings in Wyoming. Um, so go read the audible or the audio books or the, the paperback books, whatever, like those written by CJ, I think are accurate. He's also really involved in, in trying to get Wyoming to pass some sort of a tax break for um, sh- like, like Hollywood filming type folks, because all these Wyoming based movies and, and films are not being shot here. So We'll see if that ender ever happens, but um, there's it's very rare you find something that's shot in Wyoming. Wind River is the only one I can think of where it's even remotely close. Wind River was great too. It's heartbreaking. Yeah, and I think they did a fairly good job of representing the extreme of what happens out on the Wind River Reservation, and and they captured some of the wildness out there. Now I will say I think they ended up shooting some of the mountain scenes um out of state but some of those town scenes are actually in the town of lander where where i live so yeah um they did a pretty good job there yeah and there is some it wasn't it wasn't perfect but there are some you know true enough accuracies of portraying what a uh, a government trapper is all about too and you know i appreciated that especially when he just jumped the snowmobile straight out of the back of his pickup onto the ground i was like yeah that's a that's a government trapper move right there <laughs> yeah I'm excited to see if you can get some government trappers on, you know, I think the one thing is, is like, they certainly are not the the folks who want the limelight. They just want to be trapping. They yeah. want to be out, you know, and, and um, I saw a comment on one of your posts regarding that. And I, I just for the record, I think you've done an awesome job getting some real experts in to talk on these, 
on these topics, you know, and particularly the Cougar one, uh, most recently, uh, you asked some really good questions there. And I think these are important conversations to have. Yeah. Thank you. You know, one of the biggest struggles I have is getting, um, getting professionals to come on the show, whether it's a, a government trapper or a wildlife biologist, oftentimes they're not able to, uh, to come on the show and talk. And that's coming straight from straight from their bosses that say no. And it's weird yeah. because they can talk to a newspaper and that's perfectly fine. But a podcast for, for some reason is very different. And I, I know you've experienced this too, but I'll talk to the biologists and they're so fired up and they're so passionate about what they do because the biologists that I talk to are field level biologists. They're going out and collecting the data. They're inputting it. They're extracting conclusions. Like they're doing the real stuff and they're fired up about it because they're committing so much of their life to this and you know they're going out and they're suffering the miles and the weather and everything else to learn about these animals and then the information that they gather just gets lost into an excel spreadsheet somewhere within the state department of fish and wildlife of whatever state they're in and that's the end of it and it never gets disseminated out to people in a way that they can understand so when i can get somebody who's a field biologist or a trapper to to come on the show and talk it's pure gold because we're, we're blowing people's minds about this information that, you know, really should belong to the people. It's funded by tax dollars. It's not, it's not secret. Like, let's just get it out there and talk about it. But state game agencies are so risk averse. It's, it's tough. It's really tough because you, uh, like you said, like the average person has a hard time um, extrapolating what this, like the data is saying, if it's posted, and, you know, like you said, a lot of times that state agencies um, don't empower their field personnel to try to help people understand what they're looking at. Um, I will say that it seems like some states like Wyoming, and I've, I've kind of had the privilege of talking to folks from a handful of different Western states. Um, Wyoming in particular is really good about letting their field personnel talk. Uh, Nevada isn't too dang bad. They let their regional coordinators talk quite a bit. Um, but yeah, there's other states where it's just, you're running into a, um, an information gap between the average person who needs this information and needs to be making rational data-driven decisions who just doesn't have that access. Man, I also think that personally, if you have the opportunity to talk to one of those field personnel and you're trying to do something like, let's say, hunt elk in Montana, they can really be helpful in, in planning your hunt. They can be helpful in setting your expectations too, um, because they have that boots on the ground information. Now it, it's when you get into that mid tier and upper tier at these state agencies that you then get into a little bit more of the political, um, the, the political narrative that is being intended for the, for the general public. Um, that's not always so easy or so helpful to listen to. How did you find yourself in a, in a wildlife advocacy role in Wyoming? So I grew up on a farm and ranch in Union County, um, not too far down the road from you. And just the other Grandpa side of the sold, mountains, baby, just the other side of the mountains. Just the other side. Grandpa sold grass seed um, to Ducks Un, uh, a Ducks Unlimited uh, coordinator. Um, who was helping put in, you know, he, I, the, what I gathered was this Ducks Unlimited person was helping facilitate um, wetland restoration. And so we sold some grass seed to them. And then grandpa got really involved in uh, Ducks Unlimited. We went to the banquets and stuff. And then as, as I got older, I started trying to expand. I'm like, I'm not just a duck guy. I've actually like one six duck guy. And like, I like to do a whole bunch of different stuff. And, um, I followed a gal to Wyoming and uh, she was going to school here and I was just living and, and working. I was working for Cody Rich and uh, I wanted to get involved in kind of the whole realm of things. And I just started volunteering. I went to the Capitol um, with Wyoming Wildlife Federation because they were kind of being a voice for the kind of overall comprehensive sportsman. And, um, and, and then the rest is history. I ended up taking a job with them and, uh, still work with Cody on the side. And, um, it's something that's fun. I, I, my role is more of like trying to 
be a communication gap between what we're talking about with these field personnel and what the average hunter and angler needs to understand about it and then how they can make some sort of positive action or or, or shutting some you know poor bill down or poor policy decision down um, depending on what the data in particular is saying the science is saying do you feel like you've had any victories in that role I think there's been some big victories, especially when it comes to wildlife crossings. Um, and I know I already, I already mentioned her once, but Jess Johnson, she runs our uh, government affairs program. And so my role has been to kind of educate the average person. She works with the legislators and we try to connect those two dots because those elected officials should be hearing from their constituents about what's important to them. And when we were able to present some really good data about like wildlife collisions on the roadways, how effective a good wildlife crossing is. We're talking about good fencing, good overpasses and underpasses. It was pretty easy to see like, okay, yeah, this is good for the deer, elk and antelope, but it's also good for the people driving their rigs and trying to make a living driving on the highway or, or just trying to keep people safe because so many collisions are caused by, by wildlife in Wyoming in particular and, and across the West, but across the US really. But yeah, it was, that's, that's a big win. It's just seeing how much traction uh, wildlife crossings has gotten because of the the research that's come down the pipe about that. I would love to put one across the highway here where the, where the highway bisects the six ranch, because we're a, yeah. we're a primary travel corridor to get from the mountains to the prairie. Um, and it's one of the only places that you have contiguous timber coming all the way off the Alpine and the wilderness down through the Valley. And then you can connect that by crossing the river short crossing and then you're up into the you know largest short grass prairie in the nation so really really important for lots of wildlife and piles of deer get hit on this highway and that's not good for anything it's not good for the deer it's not good for the magpie that comes along and eats the deer and gets hit by a car as well it's certainly not good for the driver um, for insurance companies but how do we do this like how how do I go about trying to get funding to put in a massive piece of infrastructure um, and convincing people that that money is worthwhile? I think it, you got to look at your local, you got to look at your local climate, like the uh, political climate, the way that like you do that in Wyoming, probably very different than way, the way you do that in Oregon, just given the, the political situation, it's 180 <laughs> degrees different. In Wyoming, it's been nice because there's not a huge population center, and therefore the people who are making the decisions are pretty evenly spread, and you can go and have coffee with them and actually talk to people about a funding mechanism that might make sense, right, or like a, a solution that might make sense. The, the wildlife crossings is an easy one, but gosh, this, this is a good example for across-the-board habitat stuff. It's across-board management stuff where you can go actually talk to the person that you voted for or didn't vote for, but is your elected uh, your elected official and start working on things that might actually get through. Because one of the things, if, there, if there's anything I've learned from working with, with Jess and the legislative realm, it's that there are politics behind the, the public eye or the politics that are in those Capitol buildings that we don't understand all the time. And sometimes like it might be a great idea um, for the way that we look at the world as like the average Joe, but from the back end workings, like you could, you could know the politics at that state Capitol and be like, there's no way that's ever going to get through. So let's come at it from a different angle that will be successful because if you're just trying to ramrod something through, that's never going to be successful. You're, you're essentially wasting your time. And so, you know, in Wyoming, we came up with, or Jess was part of really this big uh, push to have some sort of a license plate that raised money for um, these wildlife crossings, for example. So then people just got to opt in for this more expensive license plate, and that money went towards the wildlife crossings. That worked in Wyoming. Um, and I think people have to talk to their local representatives and elected officials to figure out what works for them locally. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, you wouldn't think of something like, you know, a few extra bucks for a license plate as accumulating enough money, especially in a state in Wyoming that has a, a low population to be able to, to fund these big infrastructure projects. But it certainly does. You know, when I was on the commission to 
sort of re we're, we're developing new sources of funding for ODFW and restructuring the agency a little bit. One of the ideas I had was like a, a pint tax. So, you know, we have, we have a, a 10 cent deposit on all, all beverage containers. Um, and you can get that money back, but the huge portion of consumers of beverages do not turn that money back in or they don't bring their cans back to get their deposit. So what happens with, with that money, right? It goes to, it goes back to the, to the beverage industry and they get to hold on to that and they're pretty powerful people and they've got some, um, they've got some lobbyists that are very well paid, that are very sharp. They know how to move money around. So when I was trying to get a hold of that, that those deposits that hadn't been claimed, those people were like, no way, that's our money. You can't have it. It's like, all right, well, geez, where, where can I find some money? Well, what if we charge five cents every time somebody pours out a pint? That was not possible because there was no nexus between pouring a pint of beer and, and wildlife, basically, you know, you can find one, but it gets pretty loose. It doesn't really make sense. It's like, I don't know if these things are connected closely enough, but when you start looking for funding at state levels, there is not a rock that hasn't been looked under. Everybody wants more money for whatever it is that they're passionate about. And, you know, just because I'm passionate about mule deer here in Oregon, and I want to see fewer of them get killed by, you know, Honda civics on highway 82 doesn't necessarily mean that anybody else in the state is going to step up and actually pay a little bit of extra money anywhere in order to, you know, make sure that more mule deer make it across the highway. It's, it's an incredibly challenging thing. And, and I, the reason that I ask about victories is because I know that within this effort that you and Jess are taking on, there's a lot of stone walls. There's, there's a lot of struggle that, that doesn't necessarily go anywhere. So when you get a W you've got to hang your hat on that and be proud of it. And I think it's important to talk about how you were able to achieve it so that other States can, can look at that model that you used. Thanks, man. I, I think that a huge part of this comes down to like actually working with what, one of the ways that Wyoming, I think is so successful is that we work with individual organizations that have their own lists of folks who are passionate about that thing. Um, you can loop in the Muley Fanatics Foundation and Trout Unlimited to work on a project together or Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. And I think one of, one of the ways is, is tying together those kinds of people with the same interest uh, to do something. For instance, we work with, you know, like flat out, we've worked with some folks that we disagree with on hunting issues we will disagree with them on whether or not the grizzly bear should be delisted, but gosh darn it, we do believe that both of us think that there should be less animals getting hit on the highways. Um, I think that that's one of the things where it, when you can build little communities like that and reach more folks by, by only talking to a couple of people, that's where you can really make some big impacts. Um, you know, I, Oregon Hunters Association is another one that I don't necessarily know the politics and the the back doors of, but I know that it seems like they're trying to do some of that same work in, in Oregon and maybe you can expand on that. But, um, you know, that, that seems like the starting point is to start talking to those folks and, and getting buy-in from kind of these, these top level grassroots movements, if that makes yeah. sense. You know, Oregon Hunters Association has Amy Patrick now, and I was almost anti OHA for a long time. Um, they had this goofy ass program called the, the master hunter program. Do you remember that? It was like, yeah, it was like man scouts for dudes from the city. And I'm going to just absolutely trash on you. So if you're a master hunter and, and you're uh, a sensitive person, you might want to like check out of this next, you know, 45 seconds. But basically these guys that lived in town could have this little boys club and they could be considered master hunters for Oregon hunters association. And then they finagled their way into the regulations so that if there were elk that were, you know, chronic depredators and we needed to open an emergency elk season, the first people to get called up were these master hunters from Portland that would come out to Eastern Oregon. And it was chaos every time. Like there, 
the one time they came here to the six ranch, I had to go around and shoot gut shot elk for like a week afterwards. We lost thousands of dollars in fencing because these guys had come out and it was such a joke. And that's what I sort of linked Oregon hunters association with was these guys that really had no business coming out and, and doing this and filling this role. They're, they're the antithesis of, of mastery. OHA has really changed things around and they're doing a lot of good. And I attribute a ton of that to Amy Patrick. She is a force. Um, and she's, she's getting more serious about hunting herself all the time so that she can understand who she's representing better. But man, that, that gal is powerful. And because of her, I have a huge amount of respect for, for OHA now, and they're doing a lot of good. That's great to hear, man. I, I know that I've noticed just in a, the few years I've been paying attention really closely to conservation orgs is it seems like things are coming and going with personnel oftentimes. And so it, it can be tough. You know, there's another organization out there that I'm sure both of us have dabbled in being part of at some point or another. And um, that isn't always representing the way that I want them to be. Uh, and so you just kind of have to play the hand you're dealt with. And um, I think, maintaining really good relationships is just going to be the the way you get stuff done in the long run. I think a lot of people look at conservation as, um, as a, a way to get wins today. You're, and, and then that's really just playing checkers when you need to be playing some more chess, especially with just the dynamic way that wildlife exists on the landscape in the West in, in particular. Yeah. It's always more complicated than, than it seems. But, you know, saying that, and I, I've had some conversations with, with folks about, about complexity and simplicity in wildlife management, just because it's complicated doesn't mean that it can't be simplified to some extent or, or in some sectors. So you can make things simple enough to be able to create action from that. You can't just say, yeah. well, it's, it's complicated. So we're vapor locked and we're not going to do anything like, no, let's let's boil it down a little bit and see if we can get this, you know, distilled into a portion that we can simplify enough to be able to act on. And sometimes that requires a lot of work and a lot of simplicity, but anyone can make something sound complicated. It takes somebody special to simplify it in a way that makes it actionable. Man, I, I can take a sec, use a good example. It, it, uh, one of those things is wild or is, is predator management in in oregon let's just say um we can go and, and say like man we have to be managing more more mountain lions we have to be managing more mountain lions like over and over again but you're gonna waste all of your energy trying to move that ball forward when portland doesn't really want you to and instead like like let's okay let's just audible here and start doing something um that will help the landscape like let's get some more cheatgrass sprayed out and try to improve some habitat, improve some water, like um, some watersheds while we're at it. My brother, he actually, he lives and works in John Day for the conservation district. And they're going through and clearing out a lot of um, juniper trees to try to improve the groundwater situation out there. I'm not going to tell you that's the silver bullet, but I think that moving the ball forward in that way, instead of, like you said, like instead of just having inaction is is a positive way forward when you've got a gridlock or some sort of stone wall, as you put it in front of what you're really trying to, to get accomplished. Yeah. You've got to do something. An Excel spreadsheet is not going to save an animal's life. Um, it's not no. going to make there be more or less of, of anything besides, you know, frustration and human agony within a cubicle someplace. You've got to go out and physically manipulate the landscape in one way or another to actually achieve a result. Now, collecting and, and understanding data in a way that, that helps you understand what the situation is, okay, Excel can come into the picture there, but that doesn't mean that, that, that that's the end of it. Like you have to be able to go out and, and do something and, uh, and putting in an underpass or an overpass or calf crossings in a fence, that stuff is real and makes a very real impact killing a mountain lion that puts an extra 52 deer on the landscape that year that is massive that is a massive impact 
you know, it's, it's hard for me to wrap my brain around since we're talking about lions, the fact that there's, you know, an estimated 163,000 deer or mule deer in the state of Oregon. There's also whitetail, blacktail and Colombian whitetail. Uh, I don't have those numbers, but there's 163,000 mule deer and then mountain lions uh, are killing over 360,000 deer of all species in the state. So mountain lions, if they focused on mule deer, could kill every single mule deer in the state in the next six months. That's a problem. So I just, I cannot look at these numbers and be like, oh yeah, it's, it's not additive. It's, it's just compensatory predation when all of our mule deer are below carrying capacity in every single unit in the state. Like it's a big problem, but I also don't know how to get Oregonians to care about it when you could show them a picture of a black tail deer and a Colombian white tail and a white tail and a mule deer and be like, which one is a mule deer? I don't think that 30% of our state's population could, could pass that quiz. So how do I get them to care about one of these species that, you know, might go extinct in my lifetime when they don't even know what it is to look at? You know, and, and that is such an important part, just educating folks about these issues. Uh, not to mention the fact that, you know, you look at the southeast corner of Oregon, where you are so overpopulated with uh, feral horses that that adds an, an additional piece, uh, an additional component. There's a study coming out of Northern Nevada. Uh, I don't know if it's been released yet or not, but I had interviewed a uh, biologist who was talking about a study that was looking at the fact that, okay, a mountain lion population is being supported by feral horses and, and burrows on the landscape. And so that, that population level is probably significantly over the carrying capacity that it would be at if those animals didn't exist on the landscape like they did 30, 40, 50 years ago, right? Well, again, try to educate someone who is all about saving all the feral horses to the fact that those things are really causing massive landscape level degradation. You're, again, you talk about stone walls. That's, that's a big one. Yeah. I just talked to a guy um, who was cowboying down in a, on a big ranch, in Northern Nevada and huge, huge number of burrows on that place. And about 90% of them died uh, over the last year. They, they got sick and it killed almost all of them. So everywhere he went riding on this big ranch, there is either freshly dead or old dead burrows and they were just gone. And that's the problem with overpopulation is species can get really vulnerable to illnesses as soon as you, you concentrate them to a point where they're interacting more than they should. Then when one of them gets sick, all of them get sick and you've got a, a Wuhan type situation going on. <laughs> oh boy. We actually <laughs> just ran into that in Wyoming. Um, there's some really weird there's some really weird wildlife management things that are that we that we run into where for instance we'll have an island population of bighorn sheep that are overpopulated but on principle we don't want to be killing you bighorn sheep because we want more of them on the landscape like I, there's no I, i'm saying that as like that's what i believe like on principle yes we want more sheep but just recently in the devil's canyon herd in wyoming a um a, a pneumonia outbreak it wasn't mov it wasn't transmitted by um domestic sheep they don't think um wiped out 40 of 200 something bighorn sheep in this canyon you know like that's exactly what you're talking about where man like we have to acknowledge that like once we hit carrying capacity in localized areas we need to be doing something or else <laughs> nature is gonna go in to take care of itself um and in that case was maybe beneficial for the landscape that you're talking about. Yeah. In the case of the Devil's Canyon um, sheep herd, um, that's 40 something sheep that could have been either relocated or or filled someone's freezer um, had we had the foresight to to try to do something about that. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting problem. Um, another interesting problem that I'm sure you guys are dealing with is chronic wasting disease and following up on that article that I wrote, you know, months ago about CWD and how it was impacting uh, deer in Southwest Montana. 
I recently followed up with a gentleman in that area and currently they're testing at 90% positive for chronic wasting on their bucks and 72% on their does. That is substantially yep. higher than what any of the, the science said that chronic wasting disease could occur at leading up to when I published this article. And as you saw, when I, when I published that, there was a lot of hate, mm -hmm. man. Uh, and a lot of it coming out of Wyoming, people were, were really upset mm -hmm. that I was talking about CWD being worse than what science had been saying. And they're like, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Everything that I wrote was coming straight from data. It's like, I'm, I'm not throwing my opinion out here on this. I'm just telling you what's actually happening. And it's gotten worse since then in that area. Absolutely. So what's going on with it in Wyoming? So if that is the case, and I don't know how big an area that you're talking about is, uh, you might surpass Riverton, Wyoming's deer herd as being the highest concentration of chronic wasting disease. Um, they've sat in Riverton, those mule deer are sitting around 70% in the bucks, 60% in the whitetail bucks, and then, you know, 40, 50% in the, uh, in the does of whitetail and mule deer. And um, what you're seeing is, and this is a good, again, it may be more of an island population where it's largely agricultural with tree rows and, and some desert landscape where nothing has changed from a landscape level habitat perspective. There's not a whole bunch of elk that all of a sudden showed up. And there's not an, all of a sudden a big winter that wiped these deer out, but their populations have what they expect to decline, you know, somewhere around 60% in the last like five to 10 years, this massive plummet. And um, unfortunately, like you look at that situation and um, like, it's too late at, it's, it's too late to try to, to try to slow that spread or to do anything around that. And now we're looking at like, okay, if, if hunters can be used as a tool to try to slow the spread on this sucker, we're going to have to try some things. And honestly, the, the, the unfortunate thing is I, Think we're probably gonna have to fail trying some things and for most folks their time horizon is not long enough to say that failure is an option um, when you're only looking at a a 10 15 20 year time horizon you don't want to see your hunting opportunity uh less, especially the quality of your hunting opportunity degrade but when you're looking at it from a 50 60 year time horizon or even your you know further into different generations below you then you, you maybe you know then maybe the, i'm talking out of turn here but i personally don't want to be an old man and look back at when we had a chance to do something and say we messed up and we just let it run its course and now we have a totally different landscape um so right now wyoming is basically faced with determining whether they want to do something and try some things um or if they if they want to still be the kind of control state for what chronic wasting disease looks like in the long run. I will say, I don't want to see Wyoming do what Colorado is doing and just run roughshod over the resource and not have a whole lot of public input in that process. At least that's the perception I've had of how they ran it down there. So, you know, you, you do have to balance these things, um, but also education is a big part of that. And I think articles like yours that are fact-based, that are data-based, are a really good place to start and holding those up is like some some really good evidence as to what happens when this thing wipes out a herd or, or just really gets into a herd um is going to be step one and in a lot of ways it is a step that we should have been doing for a long time yeah if you had it to decide what would you be doing <sighs> look and i'm going to acknowledge it like the solutions we have right now aren't our favorite things. It's, it's what has been tested so far has been to reduce the buck ratios so that there are fewer interchanges between herds. Uh, if you think about how a buck ruts, they, they travel from doe group to doe group to try to breed does. And the idea being, if you have fewer does or fewer bucks traveling from group to group, you're going to lessen the spread. Um, there is an element of this too, where on the other side, we're, we are over here trying to increase mule deer populations. Like they're, they're not doing great, especially in Wyoming and Oregon, um, and across the West. So where do you balance this? Like, I want to have a, a higher population of does with fewer bucks in that population, 
versus having maybe a lower population overall because there's chronic wasting disease in it, but there are more bucks on the landscape to chase. Um, those are some trade-offs and those are some ugly truths I think that I think the hunting population in particular has to look at what are, what are we going to do to to try to to try to slow the spread on this thing, at least with the current information we have. Okay. So if I understand that correctly, that means that if, you know, instead of having, you know, 20 bucks per hunter does, we, we reduce that number with hunter harvest down to 10. And then those bucks don't have to go as far to find a hot doe during, during the rut. So then he's interacting with fewer population groups and containing the spread more locally. Yes. I gotcha. think that's the best description I've heard of it so far. That, uh, and that's where you also run into this thing where like, well, shit, at 10 bucks per 100 does, sometimes you're not getting all the does bread. Yeah. And therefore, you're not increasing populations. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you can take it too far. Huh. It's not easy. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not. And, and this is where I said, like, I want, this is why I wanted to lead with, like, you got to be afraid to fail at some point and expect probably there's going to be some failures along this path if you're trying to do something. Now, if you don't want to do anything and you want to say, like, we'll just let nature run its course, I know there's a huge contingency, especially in this state, that wants that to happen. And you have to accept, if that's where, the, if that's where this whole ball is going, you just have to accept the repercussions of that. And that could look that could look like a population that that's a quarter of the size of it currently is, or maybe it's a really productive country and, and the population level impact isn't huge. Um, it's going to be specific and it's going to be different for each place. Yeah. And everywhere has different dynamics. There's such a tremendous migration in Wyoming. Can you describe that, that deer migration for me a little bit? Because I think it is, really one of the, one of the wonders of the world. And, and again, unfortunately, because it's not a wildebeest, people don't, don't care as much, but that mule deer migration in Wyoming is, is a spectacle. It really is, man. And you'll go to some places in the desert in, in any time except winter, and you won't see a life form except for maybe some feral horses. Uh, but then you go out there in the winter and it's, there's literally hundreds of deer out on this, sagebrush landscape and where they're coming from can vary from 10 miles away to what they've shown to be 150 miles away there's one doe in particular that they have collared that they have shown that drifted over to island park idaho and then went back up and over the pass into the jackson region drifted down the hoback over to pinedale and ended up near the town of superior which is outside rock springs wyoming 156 miles, I think is what they end up calling it. And um, if you have any, if you've ever driven that landscape in a car, that alone will take you all day. Yeah. I, and, I, I did it in a motorcycle a couple of years ago and it took me multiple days. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the thing that you also run into, man, is, is, is when animals are making those kinds of migrations, they're, the level of challenges that they face spans the board. Literally, you have, you've got an abundance of feral horses on one end of this deal and people building summer cabins in their summer range on the other end um, and roadways and um, developments only like in between choke points that are being, you know, like I said, developed that into houses and stuff like that. Like there's just a complexity of issues that go along the way. The thing about Wyoming is, that we have such a such a low population that those migrations have still remained intact you know i i think that i think of that country that you live in and i'm like i cannot imagine what the migrations maybe probably were that came out of the eagle caps and dropped all the way down into that low country that maybe have been lost or if they've not been lost they're just not very many animals doing it anymore um there's a lot of things we don't know and a lot of things you probably can never get back Luckily in Wyoming, like you said, we've had such a low population that there's some pretty incredible uh, animal animal paths and migration still here. Yeah. I remember seeing it one time in college. We we're heading from Montana down to Colorado to hunt. 
and there was a, a flashing sign on the interstate or highway. I can't remember exactly where we were, but there was a flashing deer crossing sign. And I was like, you know, I've seen a million deer crossing signs and rarely a deer near one, but we come around the corner and there was a Congo line of deer that went over the horizon. You know, it was hundreds of deer in a single file line that stretched from one horizon way out to the next in the desert. And they were just head to tail cruising and, and crossing the highway in single file. It was so incredibly amazing to me. I never knew that deer were capable of such a thing because for one, in my area, deer are very few in number because, you know, a lot of them live inside mountain lions. And two, the, the migration that occurs here is over a short distance, but it's thousands of feet of elevation. So that lateral migration that occurs in Wyoming, truly amazing. It is. There's a, there's a hunt outside of Cody here um, where they're making a really long migration and, and the hunt takes place during it because a lot of them are coming out of Yellowstone National Park and migrating to the, to the winter range that is out here, kind of closer to the town of Cody. And you'll sit up there and you're looking for, you can be pretty selective. It's, it's a fun hunt, um, mostly wilderness. So non-residents uh, have that restriction. I'm not going to go down that road, but um, you can sit up there on a good glassing knob and you'll watch, a, you know, 150, 200 deer walk by you just all day long. They're just feeding through these, these ancient migration trails. Uh, Jess shot a buck on that trail last year. It literally walked by the carcass of its comrade and was like, huh, that's not good because another hunter had shot one on that exact same trail as it came through that exact same pinch point. And they yeah. do that year after year and they've done it for eons and eons. Um, it's an incredible thing. I bet there's arrowheads right there. I, we should have looked, I, that was a recent burn and, and there probably is some exposed. Yeah. Um, I would imagine you're right. Yeah. That's what I find in a lot of places that I set up to, to sort of ambush, um, either elk or deer as they're, as they're cruising through passes. Those are the places that you'll find arrowheads is either at a spring or at a pass because animals have been walking through that point forever, you know? The topography dictates so much about how wind moves through an area, where vegetation grows, that, you know, that determines really how and when an animal moves through an area. And any time that that's predictable, then the, the frequency of an animal occurring there goes up. That's going to be a place to hunt. So a place that I'm choosing to hunt, even though I'm doing it with a cross rifle and some really whiz bang, you know, optics that are made by NASA surgeons, uh, like that was still a good place to hunt 12,000 years ago when, you know, people were first showing up in this area. So there's probably 12,000 years worth of artifacts to look at if you look closely enough. And I, I've definitely found arrowheads in those places. And I have a feeling that, that you probably would there too, if you looked. Uh, Jess has a good story. She was stalking in on a mule deer um, and working her way through these sagebrush beds in a, in a pinch point, kind of like what you're talking about. And, um, she put her hand down and was like, ow, you know, like looked at, and she had stuck a little point in her palm of her hand and it didn't go puncture skin or anything. It just said, come up with her skin. And, and she was like, yes, that, I mean, this is clearly what I'm supposed to be doing right here. Yeah. Um, because somebody else probably has done the same. Yeah. That's, that's pretty special. So for, for all the things that. For all the things that make people different from each other, when we find stuff like that, that helps us understand just how similar we are, um, it's, it's humbling. It is, man. It's one of the reasons why, like, I, I just had this conversation this morning of like hunting in it's in itself, like is not always integral to our day-to-day -day life. Like it is not necessarily something we have to do. Um, and for guys like you and me, uh, who spent a lot of time doing it, people might look at that as, as a way of blowing off steam or as a way of having a hobby that you're really into, et cetera. But I almost think that there's something a lot more primal to it where it's what we're meant to be doing with our free time, especially. Yeah. Yeah. I think we can crack into that in a few different ways. One of the examples that I commonly bring up is you can you can hand a bow to somebody who's never shot a bow before and then give them, you know, 30 seconds of instruction on how it works. 
and you can set a milk jug at an impossible range, 70 yards, a hundred yards out in the field and say, try and shoot that, give them five shots and they're going to get super close to it because the history of the bow is the history of mankind. None of us would be alive today if our ancestors hadn't been good with the bow. It's part of who we are. And I, I find, I find things like this in hunting quite often. Another one is, uh, is eating hot marrow. Anytime that I've, that I've heated up a, a marrow bone, cracked it open and handed somebody a piece of, of hot bone marrow. When they eat that, it's like, it's like something fires from 30,000 years into their past. And the reaction is almost universal and, and there is some atavism in it, but I think it's just one of those things that is, is part of who we are. Yeah, uh, man, I'd have to agree. Uh, it'd be, the world would be a lot less of an interesting place without, <laughs> without the ability to connect with that again. Yeah. Um, okay. So if somebody wants to support you in your efforts of advocating for hunters and anglers in a meaningful way and helping wildlife in the process, how do they do that? Okay, the first step, I'm actually going to ask people to go get a hold of their local elected official, either a representative or a senator, because dang it, like that is actually the person who's going to be making decisions. They, they cast votes, and I want you to try to get a hold of them and make an impression on them in a positive way. Then, maybe just then, if you're interested in Wyoming stuff, uh, interested in what we have going on here from a hunting and angling perspective, go check out Wyoming Wildlife uh, Federation at wyomingwildlife.org or Wyoming Wildlife on the Insta Google tweet face and um, give us a follow just so you can get a little more educated and, and up to date on, on what is happening and you'll get kind of notified when something is important for you to advocate on. But I think, again, that first step of being proactive with the people who are your elected officials is more important um than than anything is the most important piece i like that and i agree when you're voting as an individual you know you might be up against millions of people you probably are but when you're when you're state elected official whether that's a, a state senator state representative or if they're a member of congress their vote carries a lot more weight and they don't hear from people as often as you might imagine. They don't hear from reasonable people nearly as often as you might imagine. So if you can deliver a, a concise and controlled message to them, then they can represent you and that message in a way that is much more impactful than that single vote that you carried that was up against millions of others. That's very well said. Yep. That is the best summary. I <laughs> better summary than I could have put together. Oh, I that is that. exactly the point. <laughs> well, buddy, it's good to talk to you. And, uh, and I, I appreciate what you're doing. Give my best to Jess. I think she's pretty cool. You're, uh, you're doing, doing well and yeah, man, stay warm out there. I'll do my best. Um, uh, I maybe next time we'll have to tell you about chasing grizzly bears out of our pheasant spots. Oh. Um, but without further ado, I'm a little late for a, a pheasant rendezvous right now. So I'm going to hit the field right now. All right. Well, get them shot early. They're not coming back. <laughs> Sounds good. Take care, James. Thanks, man. What I remember is getting up in the dark, shuffling on out to the pickup and climbing in, heading out, headlights going out over the fields and the roads and getting back into the, into the mountains and the timber and knowing that there was a, a destination out there that, that I was going to be sharing with my dad. And at some point, either during the drive or, or once we got out to some ridge that we were going to be watching when the sun came up, you'd hear that, that little squeak of, uh, of the lid coming off of the thermos. And then you unscrew that top part a little bit, and pour that coffee or hot chocolate into a cup, and uh, you can just see the little tiny vapors of steam coming off of it, curling up into the morning and holding on to that thing like, like it was a prayer and, you know, blowing some of the heat off of it and taking that, that first hot drink in the morning. And then the same thing that evening, you know, because if there was anything left, it was still going to be hot. 
like those are core memories. Those are part of part of growing up and part of being an adult and then sharing that now, you know, I'm, I'm getting to share that with my nephew and giving him those experiences. And it's an accessory to the experience. But part of what I remember about hunting and working with my family as a little kid was that there was this green beat to hell, still going strong, Stanley Thermos. And now there's a complete line of Stanley products out there. And if you go to Stanley1913.com, you can look into those and see if there's something out there that you need or that you want or that you would like to give to somebody else. And if you use the discount code 6RANCH, the number 6 and the word RANCH, and you can get 25% off of just about anything in their store. I encourage you to do it. They're great supporters of this show. They're great supporters of this audience. I love you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for all of your support and your attention. We're not stopping. We're going strong. And uh, I'm glad to, to pass along this discount to you guys. And I hope that you find something that can help develop that core memory for you and, and the people that you love. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share the show with a friend. You can also rate the podcast and leave a review. Your support allows me to keep doing what I love, which is meeting incredible folks and sharing their stories with you. For more content and photos, follow the show on Instagram at Six Ranch Podcast or me at Six Ranch Outfitters. This episode was produced by Emily Brannigan with original music written and performed by Justin Hay. Art for the Six Ranch Podcast was created by John Chatelain and digitized by Celia Christofferson. Tune in every Monday for a brand new episode of the Six Ranch Podcast. I'll catch you next week.